uh, Ontario hatcheries, we use trap nets at both lit, uh, locations. And usually trap nets are set for uh, one day up to two or three days, uh, but they're emptied every time after uh, when they're checked. Um, when we're collecting eggs, these are some of the things that we want to consider. Um, the rhyme and effect, which I have to kind of look it up here um, to make sure that I get this, this right. Basically, the rhyme and effect is um, some adult spawners have weak, uh, weak survival uh, skills at different life stages, so that um, if those individuals make up the majority of a, of a fish uh, stocking event, uh, they can contribute to the collapse of a, a, a population over time. So what that means is that if we if we um, collect all of our eggs from a certain uh, group of fish, um, and, and it's really hard to know um, if you're doing it or not, but if you do, um, certain fish can do better at different life stages. And if you put them in a situation where they don't do well at a certain life stage, they can cause the collapse of a certain population. Um, So some of the things we do while we're collecting eggs is we, we monitor uh, the effects of collecting eggs from the wild. So we'll track uh, their survival individually uh, right from day one. We take genetic samples during the collection so that again we can do genetic mapping and we can see if, if the general population of the gene pool is narrowing or not. Um, and then we prepare the eggs for incubation, which again we're going to talk about a little bit, for a little bit later, um, and mudding and stripping agents. So that's coming up. Um, so th these are, as you all likely know, these are sort of the, the basic steps to collecting eggs. And um, I'm going to go through the, these steps and talk a little bit about different concentrations and some of the methods that we're using. Um, so as you know, uh, when, we, when we get a female, we'll spawn her into a bowl. Um, we'll fertilize her with the male. Now when we're doing it, we do a one-to-one -one ratio. And that has to do with tracking uh, disease through the entire popular during the entire incubation process. So again, we can talk about um, how many females will pool with how many males and that type of thing. Um, but for our purposes, we do a one-to-one -one mix. Um, we'll, we'll fertilize the eggs and, let, and stir them gently with a feather, and we'll let them sit for one to two minutes. And then we'll rinse them with uh, pathogen-free water. So whenever we go to uh, a lake, um, we'll bring our own water from our own hatchery so we're not using lake water. Uh, there's a risk of disease or pathogens in that water. We'll rinse thoroughly, and then we'll add a concentration of tannic acid. Um, Question on the yep. fertilizing. Yep. Is it a, you put it in a, a pan with a little bit of water, or is it fairly dry? Uh, so, so when we uh, first express the eggs, we do it dry um, because if we do it in the water, the, the water hardening process starts right away. And there's a few other steps that we need to make sure happen before the water, water hardening process takes place. So we'll do dry fertilization in a bowl, and we'll add the milk directly on top of that, and then we'll add our pathogen-free water, so you know, like an inch or two in the pan, um, and then we'll stir it gently with a feather, and then. The fertilization process takes place almost instantly, but we allow it to sit for one to two minutes, and then we rinse, because again, there's, there's a couple of other steps, as you can see on the slide, that all have to happen fairly quickly for the, for the, for the purpose of the disinfection to be effective. So after that one to two minutes, we'll rinse, we'll rinse with uh, fresh water from like our pathogen-free water, uh, and then we'll add our tannic acid mix. You know, I know uh, there's a lot of different methods that people use, whether it be fuller's earth or tailbone powder uh, or creek mud. Um, but for for us, we found that tannic acid works uh, pretty consistently uh, almost every time. Sometimes we'll, we'll get surprised with pumping, but generally tannic acid works for us. And when we're dealing with multiple uh, individual batches at a time, we find it much more manageable than trying to pool everything into one big pot and use, uh, use kale in their full reserve. So the tannic acid, um, the concentration, uh, I think the concentration is uh, 4 grams uh, per 10 liters for 2 minutes. So 
we'll, we'll make up a large stock solution of this. So after we do the fertilization process and we risk them thoroughly, we'll decant as much water as we possibly can without losing any eggs, and then we'll add this full concentration of panic acid, and that's for a timed two minutes. And you can see in the photo there's a little timer by that jar, and that's for timing panic acid, it's for timing the overnight solution, which is a which is a, another step a little later on. Yep. The uh, tannic acid, um, you prepare ahead of time? We prepare, prepare ahead of time. How long would that last before it degrades? So can they prepare two days in advance, one day in advance? Uh, yeah, yeah, a couple of days is fine. Um, that brings up a good point though. Um, temperature is extremely important. So any any water that you're using, any tannic acid that you're using, any ovidine solution that you're using needs to be uh, the same temperature as the, the source water where you're collecting the fish from. If you get if you get too much uh, difference in temperatures, you're going to end up with plumping again. Um, if, especially if the water that you're using to rinse uh, is warmer than the source water, you'll often see plumping happening. Um, so that's very important. And, and how do you guys do that? Um, so what what we'll do is um, we we well we bring new water every time we come, so it's kind of cheating a bit. But you can. Uh, you can keep it outside because generally that in the month of April uh, the nighttime temperatures cool down enough so you can use air temperature to, to keep them at the right temperature. The other option is you can float your um, you can float your jugs in the lake uh, where where you're collecting the fish from and that'll that acclimatize the water to the right temperature. The only problem with that is you have to be really careful um, to not uh, infect your clean water with the water that you're that you're uh, carrying it in. Um, for us, again, to, um, because we have uh, vehicles that have tanks on them, we'll often carry a larger tank of water uh, and float our jug in that water so that we're not at risk of uh, infecting our, our our rinsing water with the source water. What's That's the concentration again. The concentration of tank acid is four grams. For 10 liters. Now all these concentrations I'm going to talk about today are in the, uh, the best management practice for uh, uh, fertilizing wall eggs and disinfecting wall eggs and I think it's on the, it's on the website. It's on the website. So that whole, this whole protocol um, that we use is on the website for everyone to see. So all the concentrations are there and the methods are there and they're, they're fairly, they're quite clear. Um, so I'll just keep going here, and then we can, again we can talk about it if other people have had other experiences with other um, um, eight, uh, agents for keeping them from pumping and sticking. Um, so after the two minutes of tannic acid, we'll thoroughly rinse, and, and by thoroughly rinse I mean a lot, like ten or twelve times, because what happens is if you don't rinse out all that tannic acid solution from the eggs, it starts it it'll affect the next stage, which is the disinfectant stage, using ovidine. Um, and it, it'll cause it'll cause uh, the ovidine disinfectant to be less less effective. So rinse thoroughly, um, and then the next step is the ovidine disinfectant, and this all has to happen fairly quickly because again, if, if you don't get them in the ovidine solution, they're going to water harden fairly quickly, and the ovidine won't have a chance to get in the micropile of the egg and disinfect the egg and do its job. Um, so the ovidine solution, again, it's in the it's in the protocol, but it's five mil five milliliters per liter is the solution we use, and it's and when you put the eggs in it, it's time for thirty minutes. So when you're doing that, are you stirring the eggs or you just them? So uh, what we do, you can see in the picture there. There's a there's a clear plastic jar. They're they're about a two liter jar. Um, so we'll. We'll again, we'll decant as much water as we possibly can, and then we'll add the ovidine solution. We'll decant it again and add the ovidine again, and we'll do that a couple of times just to make sure that we've gotten as much water out and we're, we're getting as close to the full concentration as we possibly can. Is that, you know what I mean by that? Like, um, and then once you're in the jar, to answer your question, every, every couple of minutes we'll go around and we'll gently roll the jar and make sure that they're not pumping up, because they will start to gel up a little bit sometimes. Yeah. Um, and and we've even had to kind of sort of gently gently shake them, and almost every time you can get them to, to come apart again. Um, these these plastic jars work really well. They're like a mason jar, only they're bigger than plastic, so if you drop them, they're not going to break. 
um, and you can see what's going on. So they're in there for a time, 30 minutes, and then after the 30 minutes, we start rinsing again. And by rinse, I mean rinse a lot. So um, if you're bringing your own water, you need to bring a lot of water to do this. Um, and then the last thing uh, that we will often do is we'll, once, all they're, once they're thoroughly rinsed, we'll put them in a kaolin in the mixture, which is fuller dirt or the potter's clay. And you can, we, get, we get it from our local pharmacy, and I, I'm assuming that you can get them from just about any pharmacy. Um, and we put them in a concentration, and it's really kind of general, but it's about one cup per gallon that we mix up this stock solution. And so again, we'll, we'll decant the water and we'll add the kale and mixture to the eggs and we'll let them sit in there. Now Blue Jay Creek, when they do it, they leave it in there until they bring it back to their hatchery. For us, we'll leave it in there for 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll rinse it off and then we'll take the eggs home. Um, and what that does, um, we've found, is that even, even though we've done the tannic acid mixture, sometimes you'll get a bit of gelling, um, but not real hard pumping. But, but if we do this, it puts a little coating of the, the kale and powder on the outside of the egg and it keeps them from sticking. And then the other thing it tends to do is when we get back to the hatch and we put them in bell jars, it helps to, it, it causes them to weigh a little more and they actually stay down in the jar and they're not floating up as much. So it's just one little trick that we use that seems to work really well and it's quite consistent. But that wouldn't suffocate them then? Like so. No, no. Uh, like I say, Blue Jay, when they do it, um, they're, they're probably an hour before they get back to the hatchery and they've had really good success. Um, we, like I say, we find that it's, that we can, we can uh, rinse them in te after 10 or 15 minutes and it does the same thing. And then you're not, you're not <coughs> taking that chance that it might suffocate. So. Is that focused on the BMP as well or is that? Um, it, all it says in, in the, in the BMP is that you can use uh, kaolin to, to further reduce sticking. It doesn't get concentrations in there. So it's not it's not an exact thing, but, um, and I got this this one from Blue Day. They use one cup per gallon uh, for their kaolin material. Um, is that a powder? It, it's quite powdery, it's very fine powder, yeah. yeah. I don't know if you've seen fully dirt, but I think they're virtually the same thing. Powder. And I, I, I'm not sure what its intended purpose is. I think it's like a facial play or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, some of it they spray in fruits to keep the, uh, the, the bugs don't like the. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's. You know, <coughs> well, it's uh, corn, corn starch and stuff. I've, I've heard of that too. I've never, I haven't used corn starch. But, um, well, back in the day, that's what they were using for sure. Yeah, right? yeah, it, it, uh, yeah it, it felt, I'm sure it works for. It's a nice and yellow, isn't it? <laughs> Have you guys been disinfecting all the way along, or is that something that's new? That's uh, back, I think it was around 2005 uh, when VHS showed up in Lake Ontario, and at that time they said, "You guys can't, you guys can't go back to Lake Ontario because this is a new disease and we don't know anything about it." Um, so at that time, we we knew that Lake Manitou was still disease free, and so that's where we started doing our wild collections. And then over the next, um, I want to say probably the next five years, uh, that the disinfection protocol was developed. And now in, our, in all of our hatcheries, for all of our egg collections, for some months included, we use this, this same disinfection protocol. The concentration may be different for some months, I can't remember, but, it, but we said, okay, we're doing this for everything because the risk is there for everything. So no, we didn't always do it, but now we do for everything. Are most of the clubs doing that now? Or is that it's, kind of that a, it's kind of a split. Some do it, some, some don't. Okay. There were there were studies done, not by us, um, um, that say the, the effects of it are are minimal. Um, it's the, the, their tests say that it doesn't cause uh, extra high mortality compared to not using it. So uh, they're suggesting that everybody should be using it. It's an extra step, and it takes time. Um, but it's pretty important. You, 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 you could be spreading disease everywhere. Yeah. One thing about that kaolin, it tends to dissolve in the, in the water. It doesn't settle out like full dirt. Right. Which yeah. makes it a lot easier to handle and 
you can reuse, like you can pour that over in, back into your original container <coughs> and reuse again, but you still have to add more payo. Yeah. But you don't, you don't dump it off. But that's the good thing about it, it doesn't settle up. Yeah, yeah, it is nice to work. It dissolves really easily. You don't have big lumps that you're trying to <coughs> dissolve. The only, the only danger in that, and we, we don't do it again because when we collect our eggs, we're collecting individual families and we keep them individual through the entire incubation process. So if we were to reuse that KO, we might we might potentially infect another family if, if one family was infected. So we're, we're a little bit cautious that way. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't want to get off on a tangent on that, but um, when, we, when we collect our families, um, both parents are killed and sent to the University of Guelph and tracked. Um, so that if a, if a disease showed up in either one of those parents, we can pull those eggs offline and destroy them. Um, and that's the advantage of not pooling families, is that because if we if we pool four or five families or ten families, and one of the parents, any one of those parents came back positive, all of those eggs are gone. Um, so later on, you'll see some pictures of our old incubation system that shows a whole row of well, there's 60 jars in it. Like 60 families, we keep them all individual. Um, now, what would be where do you get that? Is that uh, Sin, I think the only uh, registered supplier is Sindel Laboratories here in BC. Um, <coughs> I think I think you can buy it through Fish Farm Supply or Canadian Agriculture Systems, um, but I think the main the main distributor is Sindel Laboratories. Anybody can just uh, work. Yeah, uh, you don't need a special license for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's pretty important stuff. I think. I think uh, yeah. And how long have you guys been using that on the uh, front? On the on the eggs. Yeah. Um, like I say, I think I think that whole this whole procedure took uh, four or five years to develop. So I want to say somewhere around 2000. There's no issues yeah. with the uh, adult fish. Egg. Sorry. There's no issues with the adult fish out there. Uh, well, short and stuff. No, 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 it's, uh, it's just an iodine solution, right? So we use it in our, uh, in our medical field for, you know, disinfecting our wounds and everything else. So it's, it's a pretty safe product. Yeah. So you put one family per jar? Yes. Yeah. And do you scrape them right out? Uh, we, we do, uh, and that brings up another good point. Um, what we've been finding is if you've got a large female that gives you a lot of eggs, and if we put all those eggs in one bowl and we try to manage them, often, they, they get out of control, they do pump and we can't handle it. So what we've been finding is, is if we've got a large family, we'll spawn her into two or three bowls, and we'll fertilize all three of those bowls with the same male because we're still doing one to one, and we'll pass each of those bowls off to three people. So, uh, and then each person can manage a smaller quantity. Um, we've really found that makes a difference in, in not having clumping and that sort of thing. And again, if you if you pull a whole bunch of families into one big mess, not mess, I'm not going to say that because people uh, have success with it. But if you do that, sometimes it's hard to manage a huge quantity. So if you've got the people to do it, it's uh, in our experience anyway, it's it's better to hand them off to two or three people and each person can, can deal with it a little better. But then you incubate those three molds into one family. Right? Yes, and that's what you're asking. Yes. Yeah. So so. For the trip home, um, you know, depending on how many eggs it is, we may we may have to put uh, put her eggs in in two or two or three of these jars. But when we get back, you'll see that we use the large glass bell jars. Usually, all of one female will fit in one jar. Um, if it's any more than that, it's more than we need anyway, because um, we're we're trying to. Uh, we're trying to collect as many families as we as we can for a couple of reasons. One, we want the genetics. Two, we're we're also develop, developing a brew stock out of those fish. So our goal is uh, our goal is 60 families to get the genetics to to develop adults out of those. Um, we've had had the occasion where one female will fill more than one bell jar and we'll put her into two. But what that means is at the other end we've only got 60 jars, so we might only get. How many males would you use to uh, <coughs> fertilize and over develop a female? Uh, one, just one. 
And the reason we do that, um, because usually at that time, if you get him, they got a male that's ripe and ready, he's usually good. And I know some people might think that a male might, might not be good, and it's possible they might not be good. Um, but generally, any ripe male at that time is, is good. Um, and the reason we the reason we only do one to one is because, as I mentioned, we legal legally sample every single parent, so all 120 of those fish. So we're doing 60 60 families. So there's one to one. So there's 120 fish. So all 120 of those fish are killed in sense of the University Welfare Disease Testing. We need to be able to track that family. So if we if we add two or three or four males to that one female. We've got to kill all four of those males for that one group, and uh, that's it's it's a it's a lot of a lot of work for us at our end, and then it's even more work for the folks at University of Guelph. They've got enough to deal with trying to process 120 fish and do all the testing that they need to do. But most of our countries do with two or three males. Yeah. Yeah. We've, yeah, we've been asked to do five and five. But yeah. And, and the reason for that was to not dilute the, uh, the, the genetic markers. Yeah. Uh, it, because if you if you pick the biggest uh, hen and, and the most promising male, chances are you you're going to dilute it if you yeah. ever do it. Yeah, and I and I agree with that fully. Yeah, and, and it's and you guys aren't people sampling the fish, right? So you don't have to worry about killing a whole bunch of fish and tracking them all the way through. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's uh, if, if that's kind of what your direction is, then, then that's good. And and we I talked a little bit with the folks yesterday that came to visit our station. In the wild, um, there's probably two or three or four males that are around a female that are all fertilizing her eggs as it is. So in a natural population, that is probably more similar to what's happening than what we're doing. But you can understand why we do it the way we do it, because we have to follow them all the way through. How, how do you assess the, the prime time with the prime stage of the fish to uh, do the uh, fertilization? Yeah. I, and not to belabor, but in our case, we rely on, on help from them in our in electric fishing. Yeah. They usually give us between five to ten, maybe more days, depending on what their, their missions are. Yeah. And the last couple of years, we've found that the females were late in, in ripening, so we keep them in cages. Of course, the males are ready to go from the onset. Yeah. Put them in cages, and by the time we did get a, a right female, the males were pretty well spent, so we, <laughs> we had to kind of Green, what was left and available, which didn't give us ideal results, but that, that's kind of what we're up in sometime. Yeah, and, and I don't think that's that's uncommon uh, for anywhere. Um, we've we've been fortunate enough that we've got the, the a crew on Lake Ontario, so they'll they'll set a few trap nets out, and every day we'll go down and they'll bring the fish to us. So basically any fish that are in those trap nets from the day before are there for a reason, right? Because they're ready to spawn. Whatever isn't, whatever we don't get eggs or milk from that day, we let them go. And then the net is set again. So again, whatever's in that net the next day should be ripe and ready because they're, they're in that area for that reason. So I guess we've kind of been fortunate that way and had that luxury. So I understand what you're saying. And um, I, I don't know if there's any different way that you can do it or, or how to set up, but. Um, we have put in for that option to yeah. get the funding yeah. work over. And I know what you're saying too, because we've we've got these deep water Cisco that we're working on for Lake Ontario. We have bird stock in our hatchery now. And what we found is a month ago, all the males, not all the males, but a lot of the males were <coughs> ready and the females weren't. And now the females are all ready and we, we can't get any milk from any of the males. They're, that's, yeah, but they're, for whatever reason, their timing is, is off and we're not sure why that is. But and as, I guess I'm saying that's probably similar for all species. Thank you. Yeah. And more on that. Um, I think I covered everything I was hoping to, to mention on that. Um, egg enumeration. There's there's a 
a few different methods for, for uh, determining uh, how many eggs you've actually collected. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what people are using out there, whether they're just using sort of a, you know, a, an average number of eggs per liter that they've kind of used over time, but there is quite a high variation in egg size, which it de determines the number of eggs per liter. Um, so the two methods that, that we use, um, one is basically, uh, you, you've probably all seen these, like a, it's a bomb bear trough. Um, and the one we use for walleye is only six inches. This is exactly a foot. Um, but the one for walleye, because eggs are smaller, you gotta do more counting, so we, we only use a six inch trough. So basically you put one row of eggs in this trough and you count them. And you'll do that several times for one batch of eggs because there is some variation. And then you take the average number that that is. And I don't know if you can, yeah, you can see on that chart. Um, walleye eggs are generally you know, around 100,000 to 120 or 30,000 eggs per liter. So you're going to get 67 to 72 eggs in, in six inches. So the more sample counts you do, the better and the more accurate you're going to be. And then uh, we'll measure our total volume. And, in one of these, so and that, that'll tell you how many mills there are, and then you just look at your chart and determine the number of eggs per mill. Um, the other the other method that we use is, is just do just basically the same thing, only only we'll do a small sample count in a small graduated cylinder, and we'll do one or two mills of eggs uh, in that, dump them out and count them. We'll do that several times. And we do that for every single family, so we'll do two or three sample counts for every family and have 60 families, so you can imagine how much time it takes. But it is important to know um, how many you're starting with because it's important to know what your survival is. And if you track that every year and you try to do little different things every year, you may start to see trends on, on what makes your egg collection more successful or less successful. <coughs> Anybody want to add anything to that? Um, so here's a couple pictures of, of this is our our old incubation system. So you can see there's 30, 30 jars up this side, there's 30 jars up the other side, and they're all dumping into one tank, which was somewhat of a nightmare, if you can imagine. Um, we collected six and a half million eggs last year. And they're all going into one tank, and they're all kind of different ages, so they're all hatching at different times. So a bit of a, a bit of a, a mess. So what we what we're working on now.